Okay, hey everybody. Uh, I'm joined by t uh, I'm joined today uh, by my friend uh, Margaret Kelly. Uh, Margaret and I have never met in person, but we've been connected for a little bit of time, and we happen to know some of the same people. Uh, Margaret is a uh, is the principal of her own uh, design agency. Is that MGK Design? It is. Awesome. Uh, and is also an adjunct instructor of graphic design at Henry Ford College. Is that in Michigan? It is. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what I thought. So um, thanks, for, thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. I think it's a so, great idea. Well, I'm looking forward I, to seeing all the videos that you produced so far. Well, as soon as we're done, I will send you the link, um, and and you can you can watch or listen to them. Uh, it's just talking heads, so it's probably better to listen to them than to watch. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, yeah, uh, your your participation in this is going to really help out some of the graphic design students that I have that are getting ready to graduate um, in this kind of uncertain field. Um, but before we get to all of that. I'm interested in uh, where you, wh what your humble beginnings are. What's the genesis of, of your career? What, what was that moment you decided, like, I have to be, I have to go into graphic design? Well, I don't think it was like a snap moment. <laughs> okay. I think it was like a long time love. And I have some okay. little props here. Oh, um, sure. Growing up, my mom bought brand, brand name things. Yes. And so I was always around packages that I really liked. And I would look at the packages and study them and look at the type, like even the milk cartons. Or I used to sew when I was a kid and, you know, the patterns were always, they had beautiful illustrations, you yeah. know, so I love that. And package design, looking at package design. My dad used to draw and he would, um, he had drawing classes at our grade school. So we would go to the drawing classes on Saturdays. This was like a hobby for him. Mm -hmm. So I always drew and painted, and actually my my uh, bachelor's degree is in fine arts. Okay. So I I uh, painted. You know, I have a degree in painting and drawing. But um, my first job was at a little newspaper, a weekly newspaper, which has stayed with me my whole career. I love that job because the community was so awesome. Mm -hmm. It was in a metropolitan community, you know, near Detroit. It was a it's called Down River. Yeah. So. Um, it's near all these big industrial plants and stuff. And it was just a great group of people. And we would sit at the little, this is pre-computer, and we would sit and do layouts. So I used to draw layouts for advertising. So I, that's how I began, doing the little layouts for ads for a weekly newspaper. And it, it really helped me learn about typography. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we had to crank these ads out. Then it would go to the typesetter, and the typesetter would turn it. We'd check it. And you learned how to like make type pairings and things like right. that. So it was really, it was really fun, you know, and I learned from an old school draftsman who was sitting at his table and his drawings were impeccable. I mean, they're so beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. I wish I had some of my drawings from the ads cause they were so much fun, you know? So seeing packages around the house and my father used to take us to the museum every Saturday, you know, the Detroit Institute of Arts is like one of the best museums in the country. It's like the fifth best museum in the country. So my dad would take us there on Sundays and we would just look at all the graphic compositions, beautiful compositions, you know, um, of the painters and things like that. Right. So I really think graphic design is, for me anyways, is tied in a lot to fine arts. I mean, compositions, things like that. So I had a love of publications and I, from the little newspaper, I went on to this, um, kind of new publication that was starting in town that was like a hybrid, which I don't know, I have mixed feelings about that. So it was like a hybrid advertising and editorial. But I was okay. the art director and I worked with a fantastic photographer. His name is Chris Clore. And he did, he was like a beta site tester for Photoshop and he just did wonderful imaginative photo illustrations. So we would dream up these great things for the covers you know we would have cool so we started winning awards i mean we won ozzy awards with these compositions that we did on these little this little teeny publication so we beat out american airlines and things like that for <laughs> our, our covers you know yeah but it was like two creative people together it was really wonderful working together on that team with him so and then i went on to um, a publications company which was really cool um and it was put together by these journalists, top flight journalists who decided to do 
publications for corporations. And Detroit has tons of corporations in Detroit. So yeah. I, I got to work on GM Journal, but the twist of this was that the creative director wanted to fashion it after like, um, like the New Yorker or the Atlantic. So it was all illustrations. So I was working for GM, but art directing some really, you know, top name illustrators for General Motors. Yeah. So I got my experience working with illustrators and doing this really cool stuff for General Motors, you know. So I worked for five years and really good team. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to work with good people. Yes. You know, the teams are really important. So I got to work with some really great people, internal and outside of, you know, the people in my little company, the publications company that I worked in with the people that were working at inside the corporations. It was just a kind of a cool setup because the team at the company was very creative and the people inside the corporations were, you know, by nature corporate, but they were also creative too. So right. it was really a fun situation. So I got to work on things like um, AT&T, a magazine for AT&T, GM, Chrysler. So I worked on a lot of Fortune 500 stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but we could be really super creative because we were this small little agency in downtown right. Detroit. And it was just a lot of fun. And then from there, I went to do a city magazine for Detroit, for Detroit Monthly at Crane's publication. So, and then the people running that, Crane's is like a business a business publication company. Right. So I don't think they really had their hands around doing a regional pub publication like that. So that folded after three years, but that was a really fun experience too. And I won more Aussies there. So Aussies are like a publication design award that's national. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel good because I've been <laughs> doing that, you know, from this little, little publication to work right. in cranes. And we won a gold, so best city magazine. And we were doing really fun stuff. The editor was wacky. But once again, I had the privilege of working with really good editors. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's really important. I, actually, my husband's a writer, too. Oh, um, good. Okay. And he came up with my tagline, where imagination meets life, which I really like. You know, that's a tagline for my business. Yeah. So, um, but it's been kind of ripped off. I don't want to say ripped off, but other people have taken it. So now maybe we have to change it soon. But I've had mm -hmm. it for a while. Um, but good words and having good content is really important for working with images, you know, right. it's hand in hand. So the graphic designer kind of builds on the word and to reinforce the communication and the message, you know, so I've been lucky to work with some really good editors. So that mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for. Um, so, and then teaching is another thing. Oh, and I worked as a VP at a big agency. After that, I went to Campbell Ewald, um, which is owned by, I forget who, but it's a pretty big global agency. And I worked in their communications, their publications division too. And Farmers Insurance was my client. So I worked on Farmers Insurance and I got to go to Los Angeles and cool. present their work and, and create a really good relationship and a good team with them too. So, um, and I also worked on Style Magazine, which is a regional fashion magazine after that. So I was at Campbell Ewald for eight years. Then I worked on a Style Magazine, being the art director. And that was fun because every good photographer in the area wanted to do work for the magazine because right. it was talking about nice stuff, you know, good architecture, <laughs> nice products, you know, fashion in the area. And now mm. Detroit's just taken off with that, you know. So this was a suburb of Detroit, though. This was Oakland County, which is like a pretty affluent suburb of Detroit. So this publication was an offshoot of a publication. And they just created this regional style magazine, which was, I have to say, it was pretty darn nice, you know. And that's, that's where I started. I, I hate to keep on bringing up things I won, but it makes me feel good. It's like a benchmark, you know. But yeah, absolutely. Some uh, Society of Professional Journalists Awards which I appreciate because I'm winning it in the visual category. And I really think it's important to be authentic in your work, you know, to really find what is real about what you're trying to communicate and then communicating it visually. Like sometimes, you know, I mean, we have the tools to make things look really good. 
you know, yeah. and sometimes I do wonder, okay, is this like being honest? You know, do you want to be honest too? Mm -hmm. Even though we have the, the ability to make something look super great. Like, did yeah. you ever see the evolution of whatever it is by Dove, the first Dove commercial? Yeah. Where they do that Photoshop stuff and they make that model. The model comes in, she's got yep. blemishes, her hair is all flat, like mine looks like right now. And then they put hair makeup and they do all of her hair and then they shoot the pictures and then they do the, the Photoshop. Yep. Well, you know, that shows you the power of Photoshop. And now it's gone to incredible, you know, places in terms of what you can do with it. But I'm just saying, as a, as a, as a designer, I do ask myself, am I projecting something in, a, in an honest way or in a truthful way? And that's important right. for me. I don't want to use what we have to make something look different than what it is. So it's really important right. for me to be truthful in what I present. You know, that's really an important thing to me. So, and, and that's, that's the challenge right now. I mean, I think there's a lot of sparkle and glitz out there. And I think people, I don't know, things have changed quite a bit than, from when I started in, in the business, you know? Right. And um, I took a class uh, maybe two years ago um, online. It was an, a UX class, you know, uh, from right. Springboard, which is fantastic. I would recommend that place. They were really good. But I was sort of surprised at at just the resources, you know, there was a lot of, in my opinion, BS out there, you know, mm -hmm. that was yeah, being for sure. And I was like, what the hell, you know? And I think that for me, it's really important to go to the, the basics of, of fundamentals of design and, and good thinking mm -hmm. and mixing it with content to create a product that is very authentic and can, can hit other, can send a message and people can receive it, you know? Right. And it's like the things, you know, if you're sending out BS, people are gonna be receiving BS and putting more BS out in the world, you know? And it's like, that is something I am opposed to. Yeah. You know? so I'm not, I wouldn't call myself classic because I have a quirky side to myself, but sure. I think that I do rely on a lot of principles and, they do help me. And I think they help everybody if there's structure and, you know, things that make sense. Absolutely. So. Well, you, you covered a lot of ground there. So I have some questions for you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, I, I love the fact that you're talking about, you know, uh, publication work, you know, that's, that's the bulk of your career. That's where your design passions lie. And one, one of the things that I like about publication work is just how layered and detailed the actual production of a publication product is. I mean, you have to consider the art, yes, uh, not just the, the, the page elements, but photography, typography, uh, compositions, it's very, it's all encompassing. But you also have to consider the language, the content that, that you're wrapping into that. Um, and how all those things have to work together to make a successful page. And I'm not just saying like a successful book comprehensively, but every single page has to have its sort of own successes, right? Right. Um, and then, you know, when you get into the, to the, to the more technical end, you're looking at paper type, what, what kind of stock are you using? What's the weight? What's the tooth on it? Um, there are so many uh, great, questions and challenges to have with a publication design. Um, so you've spent your career doing a lot of uh, publication work. How do you feel now where, it, maybe especially now, um, where yes, print will never die and God mm -hmm. help us if it does, but it seems like there is less publications being produced, physical publications being produced. Uh, have you embraced the, the online publication format? Uh, what are your thoughts on, on that translation from print to digital publication? Um, uh, many of the things I do are produced as PDFs and posted online, just the, podi you know, the PDFs are. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally like the texture of paper and I like the, you know, the 
that relationship of, I, I still read real books. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't read, I, I tried reading on my computer, on my phone or on my iPad, but I really like real books. I like holding them. I think because I grew up with a lot of books. I mean, my father had our whole basement full of books. You know, I've always had books. You right. know, when we were bored, we'd just go downstairs and pull a book off the shelf. You know, so I've always had books. I love books and I love paper. So mm -hmm. I'm just a holdout for the old school. You know, I'm not, I'm really not interested in the digital and not that much. I mean, if I right. have to, and if it's going to be, you know, that's fine. But for me, I really like it. And I'm tr I try to pursue jobs that are paper, you mm -hmm. know, I still do. I know, you know, the recycling thing and everything I do, I try to use recycled papers and inks. Right. Like the that. eco-sustainability aspect. Right. I am yeah. aware of that. But I'm also aware of what human needs are. I don't think you can curl up with a book on a digital. I mean, yes, I have my phone with me because I'm mm -hmm. a news junkie. I like to listen to the news, you know, yep. so and watch what's going on. And I've been trained that way. So I do have my phone with me, but it's not the same as curling up on the couch or in the bed with a good book or good magazine. Right. So I still subscribe to a couple magazines. You know, I, I don't have the New York Times on Sunday, but I'm thinking about getting that. You know, um, I like, I, I just don't believe in this stuff. It's going to die. It's going to die. You know, for me, it's yeah. not dying. And my, my mailbox is full of catalogs and all sorts of stuff, you know? Right. It's got to be a creative way where we can use this medium that in a different way that still works, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm holding out for that. I still have some clients that I'm producing stuff for. So it's like, you know, I'm holding out for it because I love it and I don't want to let it go. You know, right. so. Well, I don't blame you at all. And I mean, yeah, publications aren't going to, to die, especially in, in print. I mean, there are just some, like, you know, for example, some of the publication work I've done, I've done a lot of catalogs, product catalogs, which is not, really exciting but one of the things that i like about it is the mechanical aspects the technical what your binding solution what paper type what process are you going to use for printing are you doing any spot colors or uh you know uh, foil type spot varnishes stuff like that um that's a lot of fun and it ultimately is a part of the cell depending on what it is so like i i, I produced a, a like three or four magazines for this company that sells eyewear, sunglasses to like sports uh, demographics, outdoor sports demographics, surfing, skiing, snowboarding, stuff like that. And it's actually a lot of fun because the opportunity to have captivating visuals uh, is there. You, you can use a good printing process and do some really awesome things. Um, but ultimately, if it's lifestyle, the delivery of that print publication is a part of the cell. You can't necessarily get that online. So context is important, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I've been looking more at, and this is still in line with that sort of theme, but I've been looking more at storytelling uh, as, as, a, as a designer, as a marketing and comms person, I'm doing a ton of storytelling. Um, and even if like, I, I'm sure you have an appreciation for how stories are told, especially visually. Right. Um, but I've been looking at, at online solutions for storytelling and it's all web-based and these websites, these web pages that are telling stories, they're designed like publications. They're not designed like websites. Um, and I really appreciate the shift in user experience thinking as it relates to that, um, because they're trying to convey something that's kind of at a, at a higher level. There's, there's an emphasis on content. Um, and, you know, maybe the functionality is, so when you're reading a publication, you go from left to right, top to bottom, and then flip the page, right? But in the online environment, you just keep scrolling down. Mm -hmm. um, but you still get the story, and ideally, it still lands. It has some impact. So uh, have you seen any, how, how do you feel storytelling is working online uh, in your work or just in general? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's really, um, 
I think it's very interesting that one of our graduates at Henry Ford, with only a two-year two degree, went on to a really big job with the city of Detroit mm -hmm. for storytelling. You know, this has become in, in, come into our vernacular. So right. I hope people appreciate that. Um, and so online, I think, well, like Facebook, those stories that are taking off where people do those quick stories. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think it's it's growing. I just think there aren't many people that really appreciate the true nature of it. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And put together a really good package. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, that's my bug. I mean, I think there are too many people out there doing bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be like, I like to be inclusive, but right. I wish there was more education towards the beauty of a story. Yes. And, and our digital media has gotten people so used to short bites. I mean, people are, don't have, they're not listening to the whole thing, you know? Right. So it's like right. That, that's something that's kind of alarming, you know, that well, change. And going online has sort of changed that. I mean, it seems like the kids are listening. They're, they're really paying attention to the whole assignment online. Whereas mm -hmm. when you're in there participating in the classroom, you know, there's a lot of interruptions, a lot of living going on at the same time. Right. And uh, they're paying it to, just really nice to see, you know, after a couple of weeks, it's like, oh, cool. You know, they're posting and, you know, they're mm -hmm. doing things. Um, but um, I think the lack of listening and the lack of like total, the short bursts, the Twitter feeds, the, you know, the Facebook post, those kinds of things, I think are kind of det detrimental to a story. I, I mean, agree. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think there needs to be more focus, a little more yeah. focus, you know? No, I, I agree with you completely. And that's actually one of my challenges right now is that like, as a creative individual, you have these projects that you just, you feel compelled to create. Like I have to make this thing. And right now I'm like, I, I want to make a very immersive story based product or project or expression. I think that's maybe the best way to put it. And, you know, the, the world that, that I'm inhabiting on the higher ed side, we have to accommodate our communications to fit the attention spans of really 16 to 22 year olds, or more specifically 16 to 18 if it's on the admissions side. So we have to feed into the short bursts of content. And, you know, we sacrifice a lot of like detail and depth of meaning when the marketing editing takes over. So, you know, a, a paragraph, two paragraphs that sets a scene or describes a particular emotional touch point or adds some texture to a particular detail or whatever goes by the wayside in order to cut to the chase. And uh, I can reconcile that. Uh, sometimes it's a bitter pill to swallow because it's necessary, but I'm trying to find a way to tell a visual story, something dynamic that doesn't sacrifice the the content you know and ultimately doesn't sacrifice on the story so um you know that's kind of my dilemma and i'm trying to figure out a way to do that which is why i'm looking at these long scrolling one page websites that tell stories because you can kind of get that detail in there uh without having to sacrifice your content but you have maybe a more of a reliance on less written word and more visual content. So in that respect, maybe it's a paradigm shift where, okay, well, maybe you have less words, but you let your images do the layered storytelling for you. You let your images and the detail of those images uh, do that. And I'm trying to find, I think I found a little bit of success with that. There, and it's not formulaic. It really comes down to uh, you have to have a good writer. You have to have a good strategist. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. You have to have good photography. Like all of those things have to work. And the strategist balances out that work by giving sequence and nuance to that narrative, right? So I'm trying to find my way here. I think there's a way to not have to sacrifice uh, to accommodate attention spans and still tell a compelling story, r regardless of what it is or who it's for. 
Uh, well, I think you hit on a couple good things. I mean, especially with the strategist sort of editing or putting together all the things. Um, I, one thing I have really noticed is the writing, poor writing has taken a beating. Oh, yeah. In the last 10 years or 15 years. And like what you were saying, people asking for blurbs, people not understanding that A, art directors are not writers. You know, a lot of times jobs come with, well, just write this. It's like, you know what? I'm not a writer. Writers mm -hmm. spend years developing their craft and right. they're good because they've, they've done that. You know, I mean, I will write. I guess I'm okay at writing, but it's like, that's not my thing, you know? But right. I, think, I think writing is what's really suffered. And I think having a good story means having the writing and the, the background, the story behind it before you can visually... You know, a lot, a big trend that I've noticed, kids are just so into anime, you know, and the different anime artists and they are, forget fine artists. I mean, they don't go to the museum. They like, they like anime, you mm -hmm. know, and there's a lot to be learned from anime though. There is some good anime out there and some good stuff happening. And, um, but I think that the written word needs to be resurrected in some place, at least even if for a background for what you're doing, you know, right. to have the content, to have the outline, to have something that you can refer to. So you can craft these cool, you know, visual imagery, you know, pieces, you know. Right. Right. Well, to your point, yeah, with anime and manga, there's a, there's a lot to learn there. And I, I don't know about you, but, uh, in art schools, it's like deeply concentrated. Like every student, I swear, loves anime and manga. And, you know, you're able to actually look at it and determine like, okay, this is good. And then this is bad, or this is kind of cheesy. But um, there is a lot to be learned from, especially if you're doing sequential art, and comic based storytelling, stuff like that. Um, I, I myself can never get into it, but I certainly appreciate it. Well, what um, makes me feel bad is there isn't an understanding of who came before that, who influenced these artists, you know? Sure. I think that's something to be talked about too, because I mean, I look at some of the samples they'll bring in and I'm like, okay, but you see, this is grabbed from this person and, you know, other influences in fine art. So I try mm -hmm. to encourage my students to go to museums and look at paintings and look at art, you know? Right. Not just, you know, look, you know this, the, you know, the, the graphic novels and the anime and. Right. Yeah, they have to expand outward. They need to see the whole spectrum, you know? I, you know, one of the interesting things for me is um, like Dadaism mm -hmm. uh, was really inspiring for me. Um, even though it, I feel like it didn't have a direct application to graphic design, unless you just use a found object and say, here's my design. Right. But, uh, one of the things that I liked about Dadaism is just how like uh, raw it was. It was, it was just authentic. There was no augmentation. There's no exaggeration or, or hyperbole. It's just here it is. Um, so when I would go down to DC, uh, I went down to DC in like maybe 2005, they had a Dadaist exhibit and I was just captivated. It was awesome, you know, mm -hmm. and just to be like, see how like people are channeling their, their creativity, especially in that particular movement was inspiring. So one of the things that I learned from that was, you know, I may not, I have to manufacture my art. I can't find it and then repurpose it. I have to manufacture it, but some of the, the principles that I think underlie Dadaism in that respect are like uh, truthfulness, uh, mm -hmm. and in some cases, objectivity, um, and then just kind of like a, this innate silliness. It's like, look at this wheel. Like, why does this exist? Like, it's gigantic and it serves no purpose. Why is it there? So it has a humility to it and, and a sensitivity that I appreciate. So I would try to incorporate that into my work. So, you know, when I entered grad school, uh, I, I would do, I had to do a publication on my design methodology. And I decided that like, I wanted to write it and it would be written from my point of view and it wouldn't necessarily be edited. So how I wrote, is how I spoke or how I perceive. And it was sometimes it read as a stream of consciousness, but it had a layer of authenticity to it 
that I think ultimately created personality and made it interesting. Uh, so that's kind of what I learned from that. So to your point, like getting out, getting into the museums, exploring the different uh, movements, I think could be a tremendous uh, asset opportunity and asset. Absolutely. You know, I, I had to teach design history uh, when I was, when I was uh, a full-time professor and I, I enjoyed teaching it. Um, but I just never got a clear sense that my students had an appreciation for it. And especially at the time, but it, it would be a year later, sometimes after graduation, when they'd say, you know, I actually remember you talking about Swiss minimalism. And at the time I loved illustrating everything. And now I'm in the professional world and everything I do is Swiss minimalism. <laughs> Isn't that so, wild? I know. Yeah. I think it does have an impact. It is a very hard class to teach. I taught it. Yeah. Uh, last year. And well, for one thing, the textbooks do not have a lot of diversity in them. No, no. Are you when, using Megs? Yeah. Yeah. The students wanted to do a paper and like the kids, you know, the kids who were African American, I encouraged them all to do an African American artist and they did and they were wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, but no diversity, even for women. It's like, oh, yeah. it's beautiful. You know, so you know, I, I sorry to interrupt, but I want to tell you this because it speaks directly to that. I would have my students do blog posts, and they would have to do two a week, and almost most of the time, I had them only do blog posts on women designers. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so they would have a full semester's worth of of women designers of all cultures, race, you know, uh, but it was mostly that because to your point they are very overlooked you know well Jermaine Greer wrote a book I don't know if you ever read it it's called The Obstacle Race and it's about women assistance to great artists you know and how they pretty much did all the work mm -hmm. for a lot of these artists who have you know achieved fame and fortune and things like that right and to that point the the Detroit Institute of Arts had this, and I don't remember the name of the artist and I apologize, but they had this beautiful masterpiece in the museum that was very well recognized and people loved it. And they found out that the assistant did it, you know, the female assistant, which I can't remember. Right. Her name. But the painting was devalued then. It was brought down in value. It's like, why? Why is that? Right. So weird. But I mean, yeah. she opened my eyes up to it. And now the current political situation, I'm, I don't know if you, this is taboo to get into, but it's like, okay, what is going on with women in our country? I mean, the fact that the women can be treated so horribly, and especially women of color who are journalists, is just ridiculous, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, there needs to be something that happened, a political, that's what I think, because this is, I went to see Florence and the Machine up, um, in the summer, and she said yeah. before her concert, she said, American women, you deserve so much better. And I was like, whoa, you know, she is talking to us like we're a third world country, but right. in some ways we've regressed to this. So, mm -hmm. yes, I'm totally for pro-women, you know, women getting more recognition and yep you know, that kind of thing. So that's cool that you did that. That's cool. I am absolutely all for that. I mean, I, you know, when you look at the composition of your life and the people in it, uh, most of the people in my life are women. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, there was never a situation where I would be uh, anti-woman by any means. But, uh, you know, I, I'm actually finding, and one of the reasons why I did those blog posts that way was because uh, most of the time, uh, and it's or happened organically, but most of the time, uh, women designers were the, the most inspiring to me. You know, I feel that maybe it's because of, of that relationship to, you know, them being, and I'm talking historically here, but uh, secondary or subordinate, that they got to take more risks and be more creative with some of the things that they did because they had maybe more of a need to make a name for themselves, right? So um you can look at that in any sort of way but nevertheless i found their work more inspiring and more risk-taking 
and more adventurous. Uh, and that's, that's what really spoke to me. Uh, you can't, you can't deny Paula shares, uh, what she's done mm -hmm. for the discipline, let alone the industry, you know? Um, and, uh, there's one illustrator, uh, she's a British woman. I think her name's, uh, Santa Annika. And she does the most amazing, uh, flat illustrations, just incredible stuff. And I look at that and I'm just like, man, I'm so jealous. I wish I could do that. And it comes down to the fact that like their, their styles, their work is informed by their perspectives on life and their lived experience. And, uh, you know, I can only help but be inspired by it. That's a great, that's a great way to possibly end. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not done yet because I, no, because I need to know what advice you have for graduating seniors uh, that are kind of entering an unstable sort of uh, economy and, and job market. What would you recommend to them? Honestly, if it is unstable, if it stays this unstable, I would say if you need to find a job, find a job that doesn't necessarily have to be in the field. And then have your studio and do your thing. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think the development of original voices and original perspectives, yeah. obtained by you know, a corporate or business perspective is what really can get people ahead. Yeah. I had the opportunity to meet um, a design director for, for Procter & Gamble. And that was his exact situation. He had been plucked out of his little studio in London to come run this because he was doing these creative things that you're talking about. Right. You, know, you want to feed your own creativity. And sometimes getting caught up in the business world can distract you and bring you down another road. And, and that's what I'm doing in my business now. I am just feeding, doing you know, feeding myself, going to do things, doing illustrations, doing what I want right. to do because I feel like I have it in me to do something that could benefit a company if they wanted to use it, you know, but I want it to be authentic from me. So I would say, try to feed your own creativity, you know, not just try to get in someplace. I mean, there are, there are opportunities. I mean, uh, one of my friends, her son was a gamer. You know, and my nephew's a gamer too. He's a professional gamer. Yeah. And this guy lived in Detroit, which Detroit is kind of like a, kind of a crazy place to be because it has, it's very kind of dualistic. It can be really going forward and then there can be a lot of recession, you know? Yeah. So the Detroit area is kind of crazy. But anyways, this guy met another guy who, I can't remember the name of the company. It's a huge company out in San Francisco. Um, a tech company and he hired the gamer to come to be a UX designer. Yeah. In the company. So I would, I would say, and I do encourage my students to this way to feed your own creativity, you know, mm -hmm. do that first. And if you have to get a job somewhere else, that's okay. Then your right. own thing can be sort of preserved. I mean, yes. inroads, try to meet people that can do you good and do well for you. But just feed your own point of view and your own perspective. I mean, that's what I love about teaching because I love seeing these fresh ideas and their fresh perspective. And I think it's really mm -hmm. important to feed that, you know, and develop it because you've got something to offer, you yeah. know? Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I would say. It's, it's good for the soul. You know, uh, one of my, uh, greatest, I, I feel for me, for my life, one of my, greatest choices but also one of my biggest regrets is also making my hobby my job so i am always thinking about design constantly in one way or another and it is exhausting <laughs> so um you know your your advice on like hey just get a job and you know if if it's if it satisfies you, great you know uh but that way you can still do your artwork and channel uh, your experience into creating and cultivating your own unique style and voice in the field. Uh, I think that will go so far because, you know, 
I, I don't want to say that careers in design are overrated. Uh, I think I'd be kind of a hypocrite if I said that. But um, I think that there's not enough uh, entrepreneurship in design. And I would like to see more of that, some self-guided career development and, you know, designers making art and, well, making good design for the sake of making good design. Not everything has to be commercialized. Um, I would love to see more of that. And, you know, when you kind of take those limits off, it's going to push the discipline a little bit further, especially with the innovations that can be made there and the unique voices that can be cultivated. So I'll give you an example. One of my students, um, she has these little dogs and she takes photographs of them. And she does funny things with the dogs and mm -hmm. puts them on Instagram. And she got like, she's got a lot of followers. And Animal Planet called her up because they liked her photographs, you know? Right. So it didn't develop into anything to her disappointment, but I give her a lot of credit for getting that far. You know, and yeah. so that that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. You want to pursue what you do so that you get attention from someone that you can, you know, possibly blossom and make a lot of money, you know, because that's our, our objectives to be healthy and happy and make a good income. But, you know, yes. you got to feed your own point of view. The politics yep. of a position can sometimes get you down and waylay you and sidetrack you. So I think, you know, for me, I mean, one of the most fun things I ever did was after I graduated from, you know, got my bachelor's degree, I went to Mackinac Island and I did that for six years during my, um, you know, five or six years during my, after high school, right through college, I went there for the summers and, and my last year there, I was, you know, somebody offered me like, well, do you want to come and interview for this job, which was a decent job in the field? And I, no, I have to go back to Mackinac. I mean, because it was the most <laughs> fun thing I ever did, you yeah. know, working on the island in the summer, meeting other people. It was really fun. So I just think you have to have fun, you know? Cool. Now that is a great way to end it. <laughs> okay. If, see you later. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Margaret. We'll uh, check in with you soon. And if anyone's interested in learning more about you and your design practice, how can they find out more information? Um, I do. I'm, my website is in production right now because okay. of the so I'll have to give that to you later. Okay, sounds good. Well, stay safe out there and we'll chat with you soon. Okay, you too. Thank you. Thanks.